Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last day of February. But before we begin our study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and for the opportunity we have each morning to open your word together. We invite your spirit's presence to teach us, to instruct us, help us to be open to your leading and guiding and, and to your correction. We ask that you can bless each person who is searching for truth and that you can use these studies to further uh, the presentation of the gospel throughout this world. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> well, yesterday we, we struggled quite a bit. Um, with uh, what we were studying. And, and the struggle was um, to take these symbols that we have in Judges 6, 7, and 8 and to place them on these lines that we've created of Jeroboam and Gideon. Uh, because we say these are the lines of Jeroboam and Gideon, uh, this internal and external line. But, you know, we could create these lines without Judges six, seven, and eight. So that is, we've already had these lines, um, the seven, seven, and seven days, and we've just analyzed uh, the events that are important in those structures. Um, so as we, we've looked at this, so um, we, we could find a parallel between Judges 6 and the first angel's message. It's, uh, the symbols are there for that. And we could do that with Judges 7. And because we already had the 300 men of Gideon connected to the proclamation of July 18th, so we can zoom in on July 18th and say that that's the second angel's message. We haven't put the verses down uh, for, for that. We did when we analyzed the separate chapters. And then when we get to Judges 8, well, that's going to be the third angel's message. But the third angel's message co continues, right? So we've always dealt with the arrival of the third, but never its ending point. And so that's sort of where we were at. But there are some things still in six, seven, and eight, mostly in seven, that we um, still struggle with as far as what way marks we're going to uh mark with the various verses and we, and we also had that problem um, in in chapter eight of course now uh so one of the things i just want to look at first before we go back to the lines had to do with the symbols of orb and zeb now we talked about these what orb and zeb represent because we have these these various tribes um Zebulun is not, even though it was originally in that group of 32,000, it's not going to be in this group that pursues um, the Midianites. And then we're going to have Ephraim, who was called but didn't come. They're not part of that 32,000. But they are then going to uh, pursue Orb and Zeb. And so we talked about what Orb and Zeb might represent. Now, originally... Uh, Oreb and Zeb we had as representing the messages of Colin and Odilio uh, that uh, contained error. That is, we accept that Colin and Odilio's presentations are correct as far as the structures are concerned. And, and it's not the type of error that we would, you know, um, uh, it's not intentional error. That is, it's, it's error that is a lack of understanding. And so we can say that this pursuing of Orb and Z is a process of study to understand the truth. Does that seem like a fair characterization of what we, what we could glean from Judges chapter 7? That could be. Okay. Is there any other options, any other characterizations that would make sense? And, and, and part of what we said is that there was an error that had continued from Parminder's understanding. 
So first, it was a false understanding of the lines, right? And then also the error of time setting. Right. Okay. And um, now, and, and if you're going to look at that in, you know, if we're going to say that one is uh, representing, you know, the error of time setting, I would think would be more connected with Collins' study and the error of, of the lines is more connected with Odilia's study, but they both have elements of, of that in it. We can see that Collins' study would be better understood. You would draw different conclusions if you had an understanding of the lines that we've developed. And um, obviously uh, with Odilio's, the same would be true as far as what we know about setting dates. Odilio's would still be affected by that. That is, we, we say that Odilio's relates primarily to July 18th, and we say that Collins' study relates to um, the Trump prediction, but both of them contain elements of both. So it's not like they're just mutually exclusive. I mean, they are tied together or intertwined. Now, we also have the raven and the wolf. And now why are these the symbols here in Orb and Zeb? Um, I mean, we know wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing that would represent something that uh, appears on the surface to be good, but uh, really is something that's destructive. But what about the raven? So, so we did touch on this before, but we haven't. Um, oops. Isn't the raven a scavenger? Okay. Um, yeah, it is of, of sorts. I mean, it, it I don't know if that's the only characterization of what a raven would be, at least in the biblical sense. Um, so, I mean, we could just go and look up all of the... Uh, so it's, it's a carnivorous bird. Um, the eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. So that would refer to the carrion nature of, of the raven. Um, of course, we don't eat ravens. They're forbidden. We know that the raven is let out, of course, on the ark. And the ravens fed Elijah. And they're cared for by divine providence. So we could look up those verses, but we're familiar with all of them. So if we're going to look at the aspects of the raven, I mean, we could say it's it's a, a scavenger, but um, there's other aspects, right? So let's look at the one, the, the first mention of the raven is Noah's Ark. So what is the raven then in that context? Messenger. Okay. Well, sort of a messenger, yeah. Um, because he sends out the raven, and what's the purpose in sending out the raven? And and then he's going to send out the dove. What, what is the purpose of that? See if there's any dry land. Okay, but why is he sending out these birds in particular, the raven and the dove? Because God told him to. Yes, but symbolically. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, yes, God told him to. But there's because the raven's going to go to and fro, and what's to and fro? We followed Miller's rules and we compared to and fro. You're a little in there, little. Well, it means, com yeah, comparing line upon line, verse with verse, but it also says in Job that Satan walked to and fro through the earth. 
Okay. So there you have duality, right? You got a, quite a contrast there. Yeah, well, but Satan walks to and fro because he's examining, right? To and fro is... Uh, Inspection, yeah, I get it. Yeah, it's an idiomatic expression for examining something. So he sends forth the raven, and it's going to go to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth, right? And then he sends forth the dove, 8-8, uh, to see if the waters were abated from off the earth of the ground. And the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into him, into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth uh, the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again anymore unto him anymore. Now, uh, how many times does he release these ravens and doves? And anybody know? Anybody know offhand? Because if you read this. Um, if you read it, it would seem that you have a three and one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so explain. So the raven is the one, and then you have the three doves, or what do you mean? Right. Okay. Now, so he's going to release the raven, and then seven days later, he releases the dove, and then seven days later, he releases the dove, and then he releases it seven days later again. Would right. You, would you get that, though, just from reading this in a superficial way? Nope. I thought it was pretty direct. Well, yeah, I mean, it. so some people think that he sends the raven and the dove on the same day. Right, because it doesn't mention the seven days in that first time, but it is every seven days that he releases the raven and the dove. Right. Okay, so, so he does this releasing of... of these birds, first the raven, and the next Sunday, he releases the dove, and then the next Sunday, he releases the dove again. Um, um, and then he finally releases the dove, and this time it, it doesn't come back. Right? So you can see that, um, and it's in the expression... Um, so it says he sent forth this raven. Doesn't say that it's going to be seven days later. Then it says he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Um, and so. So I'm just going to show you the diagram I have for this. Uh, it's not very comprehensive, but it's um, um, this is the one. Okay, so this is my diagram that of the chronology of the flood. I have a much more detailed one where I have every day marked and the days of the week and all that stuff. But this one here um, shows the 100, 250 days. Right. And remember, this was important in understanding the 300. So when we dealt with the 300, we also have uh, this symbol of the raven. Right. So it's going to happen in this story as well. Um, though these days aren't mentioned as 300, it just talks about 150 days the waters prevail, 150 days the waters abate. And then in order to get these dates to work up on the bi biblical calendar, this is the only way that we could get these uh, dates to work. And I'm just going to move this over here. Oh, that goes. Not sure what that is. Oh, I see. That's the months. That's the dates. Okay.
So there it is corrected here. Okay, so you can see that you have the raven. So you have 40 days. He waits. He sends the raven. And, th and this is clear in the spirit of prophecy. So this isn't something really to debate, so to speak. And then, then he's going to send the dove seven days later. Right. And then he sends it again. He comes with an olive branch and then he, or olive leaf. And then he sends it again. Um, and it doesn't come back. So the raven spends its time going to and fro. Right. Um, so there, there is a studying that's happening here. This is an examination. Now you say it's a three, one combination or uh, there's four, but one is different. Um, and so if we're going to address in this story of Judges, chapter 7, and we deal with the raven as a symbol, um, in, this, in these messages of Colin and Odilios, we can say that there is a studying going on, a going to and fro. So is there something then in the dove that relates to the raven that we could relate to this story in Judges or relate to our lines dealing with Gideon? Even though do doves aren't mentioned in this story of Judges 6, 7, and 8. Because here we have like two different symbols. We have, of course, the raven which we're going to say goes to and fro. We're going to go, go to that story there. And we can relate the 300 from the story of Nova, Noah to the 300 here in this story. So the 300 blowing their trumpets, we can relate to that 300 days of the water covering the earth. So there's a call there. So how else could we address this? I know it's it's... There's a lot yes, of things. This might seem really far out, but I'm thinking about, about, about the angels restraining the winds. And I'm also thinking about when the dove did not come back, could that in, in one sense mean that when the spirit of God is totally withdrawn from the earth, the dove representing the Holy Spirit, and then the plagues are poured out? Yeah, well, see, I would, look at really not, well, I'd look at the dove not coming back as a good, good thing. Because these are messages that are sent out. Yeah, but I'm looking at it on um, this way too, way at way in the future again, or maybe not so far away in the future. Well, I'm just I, know, saying, I agree with Theodore, but I can also see we can. I mean, I can see it this way too. Yeah. Well, but this is at the end of the flood, right? So, um, and it's at the end of the forty days that that we're going to have these these messages uh, sent out. So, I mean, they could, and to me, this is an accomplishment or, or completion of the message of the work of the first, second, third, and fourth angel, which is the second. Because um, we haven't really dealt with the story of Noah and what that's all about and how we would understand the symbolism there. Uh, We've never studied it as a line, but it is a line, and it has lines within it. Um, you know, I personally think that um, uh, the 40 days, because in the story of Noah here, I'll just go back to this. So we'll just look at some things here about this story. So one is you're going to have the first day of the first month mentioned in the story of Noah, correct? just like we do in Ezra. Now, we have um, two explicit periods of 40 days, right? It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And then you're going to have this 40 days from the first day of the 10th month. And, and we know the first day of the 10th month, this is the story of Ezra as well, right? So 
So already we can, we, we've talked about this before, we can already relate this to our lives. And that period of the divorcement then is from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. Right? You can see that quite clearly, hopefully, if you can see this chart. The seven, the uh, seven days is the dove. The yeah. Raven. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So we got this, and, and that's going to be 22 days if you count from the first day uh, to the last day, right? Because if you're sending it out on the first day of the week, you're going to have. Uh, 22 days inclusively, right? It's going to be the 22nd day that the last dove is set up, sent out. So we have that symbol of restoration. And, and we're going to have from the time that the rain begins to the time that um, the tops of the mountains appear is going to be 220 days. Now, when people applied this story as a year of 360 days with 30 day months when it talked about the 150 days that the water prevailed people would count from the second day of or the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month and imagine that that was 150 days but of course it would not be it would be if you had 30 day months, but they don't have 30 day months. They have 29 and a half day months. So that's not going to be a period of 150 days. So this 150 days that the water prevails and the 150 days that the water abates wouldn't be you know, two periods of five months or wouldn't be one period of five months. Most people never put two periods of five months, but some people do, right? Um, very few. And then, so we had this idea that there's 120 days from the 17th day of the seventh month to the 27th day of uh, the second month. That's going to be here. You can't really see that. But there. So that's going to be when they finally come out of the ark. Right. And so they would use this 220 days, supposedly. Uh, but of course, this wouldn't be 220 days. Right, because months aren't 30 days long. So some people believed that, you know, the year was originally 360 days with 30 day months. And I've done extensive work to show that that's not possible. And it also wouldn't be a perfect calendar because it's much more complex than that. Um, so, so anyway, um, what we have here is an actual period of 220 days. And that would show a symbol of restoration plus a 22 day period. And then we have these two explicit days of 40 or periods of 40 days, right? This is mentioned, this is mentioned, but we also have 40 days that's implied. That is, if you count from the first day of the first month of Noah's 600th year of life, it's going to be 40 days to the closed door. Now, that date that the door closes, we know, is October 22nd. It's the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. And that is, in order to get these lunar months to align, um, we have to find, one is we have to find a year where we could fit these spans of time. Um, but we already have the year in the sense that we have the biblical chronology. We know the year of the flood. And we could fit these spans of times and these dates into that year if we understood the calendar that was being used. And the calendar that would have been used would have been a, a calendar where uh, the 15th or the, the 14th day of the month is the day of the full moon. So that's it's a rather complicated astronomical a concept that I'd have to explain, but we worked out this calendar and that's why we found that this fit. And, and that's not very likely that you can get a, a calendar that's going to fit into these dates and spans of time. So, <clears throat> so it took a lot of time to do that, but 
The point is we have 40 day periods, one that's implied, two that are explicit. So what do these 40 days represent? If we're gonna take this as that the story of Noah represents a line of history, what is it representing? And how is that tied to the story of Ezra and to our line and to Gideon? So what did the 40 days represent according to the Bible? Days of test and trial and 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 being in the wilderness. Okay. Uh, well, often. how about in a less? Um, how about in a more direct way? How how would we say that? Forty days represent forty years, right? Right. Okay. So so we know that forty days is not just about you know the forty like Jesus fasted for forty days. Right. And that was a day for a year. And we're going to have Ezekiel lying on his right side for 40 days. And that's a day for a year. And the spies were in, um, you know, in the land of Canaan for 40 days. And of course, a day for a year is going to be applied there. So we're going to have the 40. The 40 days is going to represent the 40 years in the wilderness. The 40 days for Ezekiel is going to represent the 40 years from the fulfillment of Josiah's prophecy to the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem in 587. Um, and then Christ's 40 days, um, right, it, it ties into both of those. Is, is there any other periods of 40 days that, or 40 years that we are, we're forgetting? What else do we need to mention? What about Moses? Okay, well, we have the three kings. So, I mean, that's 40 years. Yeah, so we got Saul, David, and Solomon. So we have three periods of 40 years. And then we have uh, 40 days, which is... Uh, Moses is going to fast for 40 days when he goes up to receive the law both times. Uh, Jonah, and what does Jonah have? What's the 40 days in Jonah? We have the 40 days of Christ in the wilderness, which we addressed. So Christ fasts for 40 days in the wilderness. And that is because man shall not live by bread alone, right? Because I fed thee with manna for 40 days, for 40 years, that you may know that man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Christ fasts for 40 days and then quotes that passage relating to the 40 years, right? So, so we got that. Forty days within, yeah. Nineveh is going to be destroyed in forty days. So we have lots of forty days and lots of forty years. So here we have this in the story of the flood. These forty days. Now, can we say that a period of forty days is typical of a period of forty days? I mean, we know a period of 40 days is typical of a period of 40 years, but it is, are all these periods of 40 days connected? And, and notice the 220, right? So you got the 220. And you're going to have 40 days it rains. And then at the end of 220 days, Noah's going to wait 40 days to let the raven, to send out the raven. So why does he do that? 
What the forty days? So I'll be like a Tarian, like a Tarian time. Okay, it's, it's like a Tarian time. So he's going to wait. It's sort of a a Tarian time in in a sense. Yeah. I mean, it, it's obviously purposeful. Yeah, definitely. So, so Noah waits forty days. But he sees the tops of the mountains. He knows that. 220 days earlier that it began to rain. He sees the tops of the mountains, but he's going to wait 40 days. And the waters are, are, and the waters have been abating already for just a little over a month. Right. And then, and then he's going to come to the first day of the 10th month. The, the tops of the mountains are going to be seen. So the water's been abating. He now sees the tops of the mountains. But he's going to wait 40 days. And then he's going to send out a raven. Now, when we look at the first day of the 10th month, where do we put it in our lines? So we put it at where? What, what's the first day of the 10th month? It's kind of a trick question. Okay, so um, any, nobody nobody remembers what the first day of the 10th month represents in our line? Beginning of divorce. Okay, the beginning of divorce, but we put it on our line where? Oh, yeah, that'd be November. I mean, um, January 11th. Yeah, so we actually put it two places. We put it on January 11th and December 25th, right? Why is it December 25th? Well, I shouldn't say December 25th exactly, but but it's connected to December 20th. So how's de December 25th connected to uh, the divorce? Because it's the 20th day of the ninth month, right? So they're going to be gathered together in Jerusalem. And they're going to confess their marriage to these strange wives. And then, so that's going to be January 25th, 2021. Okay, so we're going to put it there. And then what are we going to do? We're going to look a year later. What happens a year later? What's a year later than December 25th, 2021? 2022. Okay. So we're going to connect that 20th day of the ninth month. We're going to connect to December 25th, 2022. And December 25th, 2022 is what date on the biblical calendar? It 
if you have to guess. Was that the first day of the 10th month? Right, it's the first day of the 10th month. So we have the end of our 777 structure as the 20th day of the ninth month. That's the that's them cat, uh, gathered in Jerusalem, right? And then the next day is the first day of the 10th month. So in our line, the next day is the first day of the 10th month. And that's going to be December 25th, 2022, one year later. So December 25th, 2022 is also the first day of the 10th month, just as January 11th, 2023 is. That is, they, those two symbols come together. So we know that period from December 25th, 2022 to January 11th, 2023. Both of those dates together, that period, symbolizes that first day of the 10th month. And then we have 40 days. So, so from that first day of the 10th month, we have 40 days marked, whatever that means at this point, right? Um, now, if we were just to go to 2022 and type in, you know, 40 days, you know, it'd bring us to February 3rd. It doesn't mean anything in that context uh, that I know of, right? So we're not going to take it literally. Now, if we count uh, 187 days, from December 25th, 2022, where do we come to? And why would I count 187 days? And is that is that valid or anything? Okay, brings me to June 30th. So does that mean anything? Okay, so it's Daniel Vanderhorst's birthday. Yeah, so that might mean something. You know, and, and you know, I still think Daniel Vanderhorst is... Um, a person that's important to this message, uh, what he has done in his studies. His studies are important. Um, so that might have something to do with it. Now, I could then just count um, uh, from, uh, so what was the other one? So I could decide to, uh, go to count from a January 11th, right? So I could take that January 11th date and count 187. You know, it's going to bring me to July 17th. So maybe if I counted from uh, the end of that, it will bring me to July 18, 2023. So maybe that means something. If we go from Colin's date and we count 187 days, it brings us to July 18th. I know Colin sees July 18th as an important symbol in his structure. Um, so maybe that has something to do with it. You know, so, so we don't know. Like, all I'm trying to say is we have this date that we call the first day of the 10th month. But what we have done is we've, we've looked at this span of time as going to April 5th, 2030, because it's going to go to the first day of the first month. And so, so that's ultimately where it goes, but there is this period of 40 days and these ravens, the raven and the doves being sent out. And wouldn't this have to relate to, um, to the raven being uh, Oreb? I think the, ra the raven's Oreb, Zeb's a wolf, right? So wouldn't this have something to do with Oreb? That is to do with one of these studies. 
and that this study is connected to uh, three messages as well, right? The doves being sent out. So what we can say is that we should be able to see this story of Noah. And in the story of Noah, we should be able to see our history is here. This is where we are in the flood. Does that make sense to people? That we're after the first day of the 10th month, and we're probably in this period of 40 days. It's a symbol. We're not looking for literal 40 days. But does that make sense to people that miss it? Either we would be in a waiting time, a tarrying time. We're waiting. But then messages are going to be sent out, right? We're going to have four messages. The first is going to be a going to and fro, right? Are people following me here? I'm not getting tons of feedback. Yeah, I, I can see that. I'm, I'm no, trying. No, no. I'm trying. It no, makes it sense. I mean, I feel, I feel like I'm on standby. I'm recircling the airport over and over and over. But I keep <laughs> plugging away. Okay. But, but we can see that we are at the symbol. We've passed the symbol of the first day of the 10th month. And that this is the story of Ezra. Because it starts on the first day of the first month. Because it's going to be the 600th year of Noah's life, right? Well, the coming back, the coming back of the dove. Uh, what would that represent? You know, dove coming back, or the. Okay. Oh, well, we, no, no, a dove don't come back. Um, right. So that would. Well, be, yeah, he does with an olive, with an olive leaf. Yeah. So when we look at the story, one is we know that in the story of Christ, that there is a dove connected with his 40 days, right? That is the Holy Spirit descends upon him yeah. as a dove. And straightway, yeah. he goes in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted of the devil, right? And then at the end of that temptation, we're going to have uh, Satan come, or the end of that wilderness, On he's going to come with his three temptations, right? And, and yes. Satan sense is he and he's a wolf in sheep's clothing that is he's he pretends to be an angel a good angel sent from god right you know and he says if thou be the son of god right which of course christ knows my my father said you know 40 days before this is my beloved son and him i am well pleased and and that's why he quoted Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He quoted that from Deuteronomy, dealing with the 40 days of the spies and the 40 years in the wilderness being fed of manna. So, um, so he knows he's God's son, and for an angel from heaven would not question that and try to get him to prove it. And Christ is our sin bearer there in those 40 days. He feels as a sinner it doesn't appear to him that he's the son of god so so we can see that there is these um these three weeks if we want to look at it that way is 22 days that symbolizes these three temptations now in our history um we have this 40 days it, it must be a symbolical period we wouldn't say that we're going, we can attach this to any span of time. Um, though we do attach the first day of the first, the first day of the tenth month to the first day of the first month, uh, in a way that we would say is, um, we we have us we have dates in our history for that. But we're not looking for dates in the forty days. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, um, so now when we look at each of these, these so we know that the raven's going to go to and fro. So this is a study that's going on. And, and it's going to continue this until the waters are dried up. 
right? So the raven is constantly going back and forth. He's going to continue to go. The dove is sent out, um, but it's not going to find any rest for the sole of her foot. And then Noah's going to put forth his hand and, and take this dove into the ark. And he's going to stay yet seven days. And, and that yet seven days means that he had waited previously seven days. So that's how we know there's seven days from the raven to the dove. Because he has to stay yet seven days. And that means, again, seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. So this is the this is going to be two weeks after he sends out the raven. Now the dove comes with this olive leaf plucked off. Now it says that Noah knew that the waters were abated. Well, well, they weren't completely abated, right? So um, now that's in Genesis 8, 11. Just the top of the mountain we're seeing, that's all. Well, well he saw the top, tops of the mountains. Um, at this point, you've had um, uh, two, two weeks plus 40 days since the tops of the mountains were seen. So you're going to have 40 plus um, 14, so that's going to be 54 days since they saw the tops of the mountains. And, um, and then he's, uh, and then he stayed yet seven other days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. So that's going to be 62 days since, um, well, six, 62 complete days, 61 days, if you're counting cardinally from when they saw the tops of the mountains. All right, and then it says it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, so 601st year. So, I mean, we've started in the 600th year of Noah's life on the first day of the first month, and now we're to the first day of the first month, and the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And then in the second month and the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. And that's when they're going to leave the ark. So they're going to wait, you know, another 27 days until, or the 26 days, I guess, until they leave the ark after they take off the covering of the ark. Could you move the rest of the chart over a little bit? Oh, you, yeah. You, yeah, you I could do that. that. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see just the end of it right there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Thanks. But I shouldn't say another. So that's actually going to be three months and 26 days. So that's going to be what? 56, 57 days, whatever. It depends how many days in that month. Okay. So, so it's going to be a, a long period of time after they remove the ark until they leave the ark, remove the covering of the ark until they leave the ark. But they mark that first day of the first month. I know in uh, Uncle Arthur's Bible story books, it said they made the day special by removing the roof of the ark. I'm not sure that that's what they were doing. That's prob probably just uh, to make it interesting for kids. But, um, but we can see it goes from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. But it has this additional span of time, which is going to be whether it's 30 plus uh, 26 or it's going to be 29 plus 26. I don't know. But I'd have to look it up. I didn't put the, our dates on our calendar down here, though I could have. Um, anyway, <clears throat> we, we seem to be going a little bit out of our way, but this is important to understand Orb and Zeb, right? Because Orb and Zeb, have to relate to messages that are in this movement because it's about this movement that have error in them but are correct on 
on, on one level, because it's, it's the studying of these messages that are going to solve the problem, right? So one of the things that we have done is we, we didn't denounce, you know, Colin and, and Odilio as apostates. We didn't, you know, attack what they were saying. What we looked, we did is we looked at what they were saying and saying, you know, this is from God, but it's being misapplied. And it's not being misapplied because Odilio and Colin are evil. It's being misapplied because you still need to be studied to understand what they mean. And that would be true of everything that we've studied, right? We know that we don't know what this all means. We don't know how to apply it. We only know we can't set dates. And, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say we only know. We know we can't set dates, but we also know that things are coming that we don't fully comprehend. So we know that we don't know stuff. That's the other thing we, we know. And that we're supposed to be studying and that we're moving towards the upper room. And that this is going to take humility on our part to be corrected. Just as it takes humility on everyone else's part. Because this is a divorce, right? We're being divorced from the strange wives. And we, we can't argue that we are the ones, whoever we are, that are correct and that the other people are wrong. Because are we not, is not this movement married to strange wives? And that a divorce needs to occur, right? Agreed. So, so we all are in the same boat. No, no pun intended there. Um, so the story of Noah is definitely relevant to our lines at the present. And that raven being there, Oreb, can't be ignored. But the doves represent messages, as does the raven. And, and we already said that Oreb represents a message. And so does Zeb. So, so there we dealt with Oreb. How do we deal with Zeb? How do we deal with the wolf? So, I mean, we can look up the wolf. Um, and look up the verses dealing with that. So let's go there okay so if we're going to deal with the wolf of course we have um you know directly the first mention is benjamin benjamin show raven or raven as a wolf in the morning he shall devour the prey and at the night he shall divide the spoil so um, this should remind us of something. What does this remind us of? Princes are like e evening wolves, which is also in, in the Minor Prophets. Forget which one, but I'm going to look um, it up. Yeah, that's going to be um, Zephaniah 3. I think you're talking about. But... So, so when we deal with though this passage, in the morning he shall devour the prey, at the night he shall divide the spoil. This should remind us of another verse. This is Isaiah eight. Maher shalal hashbaz. Right. So, so remember, this is in the context of this vision that you're going to write on a group, uh, take the a great role. This great role is a mirror, right? This is about the prophetic mirror, right? Isaiah 7 and 8, and 9, 10, 11, and 12, right? The start of that prophetic mirror. And Maher Shalal Hashbaz, his name 
means um, swift to the booty, speedy to the prey. Uh, there's other ways it could be translated. Um, uh, hasting as he, the enemy, to the booty or right, to the spoil, swift to the prey. And we just had looked at uh, Genesis uh, 49. He shall devour the prey at night. He shall divide the spoil. So he shall raven as a wolf. So what, what does this mean? And, and raven, or raven, however you say that word in English, I don't know, um, means rend in pieces, tear in pieces. Right, and this wolf is going to be Zeb. In contrast that with Isaiah 53, 12 about Christ, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul onto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he yeah. bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we got we got that. Now, how does that relate to um, uh, Isaiah chapter eight? Because the question is, why does Isaiah chapter eight even mention what what is what is the purpose of Mount Hershel al Hashbaz? Well, he he was supposed to be a sign, right? Thy yeah, sons will be signs to Israel. Yeah, his the sons of Isaiah, uh, both um, right. uh, the first one mentioned there. Um, can't think of his name. It should be easier than Mahershala. Share Jay Shub, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, so Share Jay Shub, and, um, and that he's going to be, uh, let me see here. His, his name means a remnant will return, right? So you can see that there are there are these two sons, a remnant shall return, and then the other one is representing um, hasting as an enemy to the booty, swift to the prey. So this is something about those that aren't going to return, right? So we can see the two classes represented there. Now, we could argue when we go to Judges, um, chapter 7 there, and we're dealing with Oreb and Zeb, you know, we could say that these, these represent two classes. And that's always a possibility, you know, the, the raven and the wolf. Though I think it makes much more sense to look at these as messages. Um, but, we, yeah, when we look at the wolf... It's not, um, let me see if I can go back here. Oh, they did. Okay, so when we looked at the wolf, we were looking at these verses, and I had that. Nice chart there where you could just look at them. I mean, we could just look at the word wolf, Zeb. Um, to do that. Okay, so. Well, this doesn't give us all the verses here. This just gives us where Zeb is. So we got, um, you know, Psalms 83.11, it says, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. You know, all their princes is Zeba and Zalmunna. So it's going to be referencing in Psalms 83, this story in Judges. And then, of course, we have it in Judges 8.3 mentioned again, right? So that's where we're going to have that word Zeb as a name. Uh, we could also have Zeb. This way again. So that was Zeb as a name. And... 
it relates to this one. So here's going to be the one for the wolf, 2061. And so that's a wolf. And then it's going to give us the Genesis 4927, Isaiah 11, 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, whatever, lie down with the kid. Isaiah 65, 25. Again, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Jeremiah 5, 6. Wherefore, as a lion of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them, a leopard shall watch over their cities. So this wolf is also connected with spoiling. And Ezekiel 22, um, verse 27, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls and to get dishonest gain. Habakkuk 1, Habakkuk 1, verse 8, the horses are swifter than the leopards and are fierce, are more fierce than the evening wolves. Now, they often have the wolves connected with evening. Now, that's kind of interesting. Um, what is the word evening in Hebrew? Arab. Uh, Arab, right. Now, if you look up, I mean, Oreb is Ein uh, Resh uh, Bet, right? And if you look up the word Erev, evening, so I'm just going to go back. I'm going to go back here. Oh, there we go. And it was here. Um, you'll see that they're spelt the same. Um, so if you look here, it's going to show Arab. See how they're spelt the same? So when it talks about Oreb and Zeb, um, you could even really just say this is the evening wolves. Now, now, the difference is just in vowel pointings, right? So it has to do with how... Uh, these words look in Hebrew. So I'm just going to see if I can show you here. Um, well, this one doesn't give me the vowel pointings, so I need to find one that does. So anyway, we can see that there's this evening wolves is connected to, and, and why is a raven called a raven? What, why do they give it that name? Because it because of its color, which is dark, like the evening. Right, dusky. Okay, so what does that mean? How are we going to then apply this to our lines? Darkness, uh, spiritual darkness, or. Okay, but we got these orb and Z. So we can say this is the evening wolves, right? These yeah. messages, which we're saying are Colin and Adelia's message. And so we're not we're not looking at these things. Um, you know, negatively, so to speak. I mean, they're messages. And Maybe they, message. Yeah. Yeah. They, they're messages, but there's something wrong with them. And it's going to be the men of Ephraim who pursue them. Shed and, more, shed more, shed more light on them. Yeah, we'll shed, shed more light on them because this, this is, this is about studying, right? This isn't about actually killing anything. Right. Yeah. This is about studying something, right? That's how we're taking it. God feeds the raven. Um, well, the ravens feed us, right? But it's also. I, I think God feeds the raven too. Yeah, he takes care of the ravens. Yeah. And 
right? So the, the raven doesn't need to worry about being fed. God cares for the ravens, he cares for the sparrows. But the primary application would be um, of a raven in that it's, uh, it's used in Noah's Ark, right? It's, it's gonna be a message. It's dark like evening. We don't generally think of it as a positive thing, but it's gonna feed uh, Elijah, right? He's gonna be fed by ravens. The raven doesn't. The raven doesn't come back, right? No. Well, the raven goes to and fro, so it means it just comes and goes. Oh, that's right? okay. Okay. He doesn't yeah. take it. He doesn't take it into the ark. So it just it just keeps searching, right? That's what the Search. raven. Yeah, yeah. It's searching. it's searching, constantly studying the Bible. It's right? the truth. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's a symbol of a Bible study. So there's something that's the product of study. But, but in this case, it needs to be defeated. That is, we're not taking it, you know, that, you know, somebody needs to be killed or anything like that. We're just saying that there is, that these messages are something that need to be corrected. It's, it's the divorce from the strange wives. That is, the messages themselves haven't truly been following Miller's rules. A dove coming back would be assurance, would be kind of assurance. The, the coming back would what? Be what? The, the dove coming back would be an assurance. Adherence? Assur assurance. Oh, assurance. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so we think that these messages are accomplishing the work, right? But it's going to start first with the raven after 40 days, which is 40 days from the beginning of the divorcement, right? So this is the process of the divorcement. Um, yeah, so, so we have um, that word, uh, Oreb. Uh, it's the vowel pointing that distinguishes it from Erev. Um, because in, uh, you can't see it here, but um, so I'm just saying that there's, there's, it's just not a coincidence that we have Oreb and Z put together. Um, so Angela puts, uh, we three, see through a glass darkly, right? And then we will see face to face. So we need, this revelation of Christ, however we want to understand its connection to the Mara, to the looking glass, right? So we know that this message is bringing us to the looking glass. And in the looking glass, it's Christ's character that we see, and it shows us our defects of character, right? Because the problem is we have defects of character that we don't know, that we don't fully understand. So just for the Hebrew people, so if you're looking at Habakkuk 1, verse 8, and you see the word there, Erev, which is just right here, the 6153 at the right here, there's that word Erev. In, in Hebrew, they put some vowel pointings uh, above the ein and below the resh that, that give you this Erev, right? So it's like these short E sounds. And this B is pronounced, well, it could be Arab or Erev. It's probably, it was originally a B sound. And then when we look at um, this one here and you see the same word, um, it's going to have a vowel pointing above this that gives it an O sound. So Oreb and and that's why it's it's different. So it's just a little bit different vowel pointing. Um, but so you can see Oreb and Zeb are connected with the evening wolves. In a sense, the evening wolves 
have that same connotation of Oreb, because Oreb is just called that, that is a raven is called that because of its color. Okay, is this helping us at all? <laughs> all of this studying of Oreb and Zeb in understanding these lines. Yeah, I think it's clarifying a little bit. Okay. Uh, our history. I think it is, and I think it helps us to place these uh, lines more, um, you know, to fix these lines more solidly. So when we, we're going to take Orb and Zeb, when we take this, this arrival of the third angel, that, that you know, we say that, that this is going to go to 2023, judges this, right? But we can see these 777 structures just bring us to December 25th, 2021. But that means this message of Orb and Zeb is, is leading us to the arrival of this third message. So again, it's really difficult to take Judges 6, 7, and 8 and just put them on a line together because each of these chapters seem to always bring us to the end, right? That's... I'm going to change my screen here. Um, right? So when, when we look at these dates here, I mean, Oreb and Zeb, this is at the end, right? This is the first day of the 10th month. And now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this. I'm going to move this. I'm going to move this closer together and move these over. Okay, now what I'm saying about these way marks, I'm going to put this as I guess it could have just done this. Okay, December 25th, 2022. Now, why am I doing this then based on what we just talked about? So I have these symbols here, the fourth angel arriving, right? And we, we think about the story of Noah. We think about the first day of the 10th month. And, and then we have these 40 days. So you're placing the formalization and the empowerment of the third angel's message after the fourth angel arrives. Um, okay, explain what, what you're saying. I don't well, I'm, as I'm looking at the diagram right now. Okay. We've normally gone, as, as has been shown from scripture, yeah. Bible formalization empowerment. What's being shown right now is that's occurred in the first and the second, but you're placing third angel arriving and then the fourth angel arriving. Okay. Okay, I see what you're asking. So in Millerite history, in the first generation, do they have the fourth angel history? No. Well, I would say that they do, right? So oh, you said Millerite first generation. That's why I was. Okay. So, okay, the first generation of Adventist history. So, after, because I consider that whole thing the first generation. So, Jeff starts the first generation at 1798. And so, in Millerite history, when we talk about the first generation, we're talking about the first generation of Adventists, right? So that, that would include, according to Jeff, all of Millerite history. But we're, we're saying that Millerite history leads to October 22nd, 1844. So the first generation, there's a falling away. Right? And that falling away is represented by the fourth message. It happens in the story of Nehemiah. 
the streets and the walls, right? All right. That's, that's in the first generation. So what I'm doing when I'm placing this here, I'm looking at this as that that that's Millerite history that's being represented in that 777 structure that we're repeating. Of course, this is a zoom into a line, but but every line that we have is Millerite history. And when you have a third angel arrive, you're going to have a fourth. But that fourth is going to first be a falling away of the first generation. Then you're going to have four generations. And then the next major reform line, right? So when we look at Millerite history, you know, October 22nd, 1844, the third angel arrives. And the fourth angel, in a sense, attempts to uh, arrive in all of those histories. So we see it happen in 1863, right? That's how we look at it. 1863 is the fourth, fourth angel arriving or the second angel. And But because the first angel's message has been rejected, the church is Laodicean, the second angel's message is then rejected instead of accomplishing the work, right? You know, Hiram Edson wrote those articles if those articles had been accepted, if Adventism was prepared, Jesus could have come in that history, right? The second angel's message would have been empowered. It, it would have arrived. It would have been formalized. It would have been empowered. And uh, the work would have been done. But it didn't happen, right? You have a falling away. And then we have... In that history of 1888, even in the second generation, we see that the, the angel of Revelation 18 came down, right? Joan says, and Ellen White appears to agree with him. The Sunday law is imminent. But because they had rejected... The, the angel came down with the righteousness by faith message? Well, it wasn't so much the righteousness by faith message. He believed that the Sunday law had begun, right, in 1892. And so in 1883, that's what he's saying. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. That's what he's saying in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin sermons. And we agreed when we studied that, that he was correct. Because Ellen White agreed with him. But the world didn't come to an end then. The Sunday law did not follow. And in our history, we can parallel that to Jones' history. You know, they had the Chicago World Fair, right? Um, we have the pandemic. They're both types of the Sunday law. So in our generation right now, what this movement is looking for is they're looking for the Sunday law to be imminent. Is that wrong? Is it wrong to look at the Sunday law as being imminent? No, White, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. Necessary. No, it's part of watching and waiting. Ellen White saw the yeah. Sunday law as imminent. Because in a sense, the Sunday law could be imminent if God's people had accomplished their work. But they didn't. And we haven't. But we want to, Right. We want to see this history wrapped up, this world's history wrapped up. And we can, we can look at these lines and see basically we're following the pattern, pattern of Millerite history. We're failing just as the Adventists failed after October 22nd, 1844. We were disappointed like they were, and we're failing like they were. So what, what makes us think it's going to be any different? Is it going to be different?
So we know a Sunday law is coming, right? Now, what we have here is we have our history. And in our history, we have a failure. But we also have some way marks that are being marked here. This is the divorcement from the strange wives. Now, we know in the story of Ezra that we have the divorcement from the strange wives, and then we have the first day of the first month. And so we can see um, that we have this in our history. Now, again, we're looking at a date that's far into the future. I mean, from my perspective. I mean, if you're really young, that seems well, seven really years. Far. Yeah, it, yeah. If you if you're a little kid, that would be way far into the future. Yeah, but for us, it's not too far. <laughs> but if you're an old old person and you, you know, well, maybe it could be far in the future because you think I'm never going to live that long. Yeah, so, okay, I'm gone. But but you know, time goes by pretty quick. Um, you know, we're in 2023. It's going to be seven years this July since Heidi was anointed you know, in 2016. So, um, so another seven years to April 5th, 2030, seems like a long time, but we don't know what that date means. We don't know if it's an actual date or if it's just a symbol, right? Just a symbol to help us understand um, where we are in the lines, right? So it could, it could mean nothing as far as an event. Christ could come before then. So we're not saying that, you know, Jesus can't come until after April 5th, 2030, because we have this date in the future, because we're not predicting an event. We don't know what that date means. And, and of course, our probations can occur long before Christ comes. We can close our probations. <clears throat> So, um, so, so we can put Oreb and Zeb here, um, and maybe in some ways, you now what's the difference between, so this is Colin's prediction, right? January 11th to 12th, 2023. I mean, Colin never sets that date, right? But his lines show that he should have for his prediction, right? For what he was saying about Trump and the lines in the 65 days, he should have put that date there. You know, that inclusive count that ends at midnight on January 11th, right? Commences January 12th. He should have done that if he was consistent. But what about the December 25th, 2022 date? Like, where do we see Odilio's, if we're saying that, that Orb and Zeb represent Colin and Odilio's study, does December 25th, 2022 have anything to do with Odilio's study? When did they, um, when did they present their studies again? Uh well, well, Colin's study was presented December 25th, 2021. So that was the oh. end of 777 lines. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. And, then, um, and then the next day we began the study of understanding the lines. So that's the study we're in presently. Then Odilio's was uh, about February, after that. February 12th, seven weeks later. Okay. All right. Um. So then we have this uh, these studies. Um, let me see here. Let's see if I can find this. Um, 
I got way too many. I need to organize my files in my folders better. Um, okay, so um, I'm just trying to remember because I'm pretty sure that in Odilio's study, I mean, there is a reference to things um, uh, that would relate to the end of our lines. So just trying to remember what it was. Uh, let me think here. Okay. I wish I had a perfect memory. I just don't. Um, so with with the Delio study, so Delio studies, he did actually a few different studies. So he did a study, uh, the Nero study. So that one's earlier, right? That's going to be in. Can't remember when the Nero study was done, but this is something that he had been working on, and he. And this, this sort of confirmed our understanding of, of what had happened in connection with um, October 13th. And, and so that Nero study was important in um, our analysis of understanding the presidents of the United States. So he had a study dealing with Nero, what he thought was going to happen. He did, this, the main study that we're talking about is the mandate study. So that's going to be the February 12th, 2020 one that he's or or 2022 pardon me that he's going to present this study uh dealing with the mandates and that um that the spans of time produce all these july 18 2020 symbolism now he's going to do another study later and that's going to be the one where he takes zebulon and um connects the organization of the Adventist church um, to the numbering of the tribe of Zebulun, whatever it was, 57,400, I think it was, um, to October, or not to October, to July 18, 2020, right? So, so we have these pretty amazing um, uh, studies, right? Colin's study has a lot of things in it as well. Uh, that relate to spans of time and numbers. But we're saying that these are the messages of Orb and Z. So that's what, one of the things we have, to, we have to sort out. What does that particularly mean? And now we also had this symbol of the 1629, which we used in that one study. So if I'm going to just quickly go here, I know we're getting late here. So this 1629 number ended up being connected to the time setting of June 9th, but this is 2018, right? So this is going to be when Jeff has that 9-11 prayer, right? And that's going to connect us to November 24th, 2022, right? And that's well, What's significant about 9-11 prayer? That's the time setting. That's when we begin our 12, uh, 126 days to October 13th. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's going to uh, close the Sabbath. Right. And then on June 10th, Parminder is going to present. So there's 1,629 days to that November 24th, 2022 date. And, um, and this was, uh, yeah. So 11 times 24 is 264. Right. So we, we, we did a lot of stuff dealing with that. And we, we found um, a lot of information in connection with uh, what November 24th meant. It also, there's the 1,629 weeks, the misdated New World Order Bush, uh, misdated as September 11th, 1991. He actually presented on September 23rd, 1991. So people, he did do a New World Order speech one year earlier. 
So you've got an anniversary. <clears throat> and yeah, this one here is going to give us uh, also the 11,900 days going back to the symbolic date of April 26. And then from that date to um, April 5th, 2030 is going to be the number of days from when the mana first fell to when it no longer fell. Um, so, so we have all of the, these connections uh, between these, these dates and Odilio's number of the 1629 comes into play. Now, um, now 1629 is um, a period of time that is about four years and a half. Um, so four and a half years. And um, 168 days, that was it. And 168 days has, 168 is a symbol of the number of hours in a week, right? So, so we had this symbol here. And so we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow and address this. Any questions before we close with prayer? Is it coming clear together? Or do I just keep muddying the water every time it gets clear? No, it's it's clear. Little okay. by little, stone by stone, brick by brick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm getting a better picture of it, how how these lines fit together. But so each one of these, these, these uh, chapters in the story of Gideon are the lines. But we can see how they also do, like they represent the, the first, second, and third angels' messages. But they also bring us all the way through the line. So I don't know if we can go from chapter six, seven, and eight and just you know, I don't know how that works because every one of them is going to give us the line. So that's that's what we're going to have to try to sort out. That's what I was trying to sort out. Um, we're getting closer. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love. We ask for a blessing upon the rest of this day. Help us to continue to study your word, to think on these things. We pray that your angels can be around each person, that your Holy Spirit can comfort them. We know the trials that we face each day, and we need you every moment. We pray for this movement. We pray for the camp meeting that we're planning. And we ask, Lord, that you can lead and direct. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.